Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith, knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Well, good morning, everyone. Once again, we're here at the uh at the computer or the whatever it is device that you're using to uh, join us with worship. Um, we are so happy that you are here um, with us and uh, we pray that one day soon we'll, we, we will be all back together for in, in uh, house worship. Uh, but in the meantime, this will have to serve a need um, as for the fact that it's still not safe to gather on Sunday morning. Um, and we have to have safety. I, I um, I'm a firm believer in that, and I believe you are as well. So enjoy the worship service.
Now the scripture reading for this morning is found in Mark's gospel. We're going to be looking at chapter 20, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to be looking at chapter 1 and verses 21 through 28. It's uh, titled, Jesus Drives Out an Evil Spirit. They went to Capernaum, and then when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus said sternly, be quiet and come out of him. The evil spirit shook him, shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him and news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Let's bow our hearts together. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to, to uh, deliver a word pray prayerfully in due season for those who need to receive it. And Lord, I ask for your blessing in all these things and allow your presence to be felt. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who are familiar with the Bible, and particularly the four Gospels, we know that Mark's Gospel is the shortest of all. What you may not know is that much of Mark's Gospel is actually foundationally found in both the Gospels of uh, Matthew and Luke. Now, um, with the audience that Mark is believed to have been writing to was predominantly a Jewish audience who had come to their faith in Jesus Christ. So, much of what Mark does is he leaves out some of the details that an observant Jew would know is going on. But for us in our 21st century uh, settings here, we, we are kind of at the mercy of, uh, you know, trying to read between the lines or, 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 or see what's there. And, and contrary to, to Mark's 
terseness, if that's how I can put that as the word, um, there's a lot of things going on that we might miss. Of course, the first one is pretty evident that Jesus is demonstrating right off the bat that he is a righteous and observant Jew by attending synagogue services on the Sabbath. Now, it's also clear that he has reached the level of acclaim in that he's been asked actually to do the teaching for this particular service. Now, we don't know the subject of Jesus' teaching. It doesn't seem to be all that important for Mark to write it down. But whatever it is, we learn that it amazes the congregation. And see, what, what actually amazes the congregation isn't the subject of his teaching so much as the way he teaches it with authority. Now, what that means, traditionally speaking, is that anyone who is invited to teach in a synagogue setting, you know, would basically be able to uh, prayerfully be conveying biblical truths, generally uh, revealed by others, more, you know, scholars and, and, and rabbis of some acclaim. Now, we would, at the point when they would be making a point, you know, during their message, the speaker would then, you know, basically give credit to that particular individual, such as, you know, where they got their knowledge from, such as according to Moses has, what Moses has taught us, or, or what scripture reveals to us about Leviticus, or what the prophet Isaiah says, and reminds us, or what Rabbi so-and-so would say. But, and, and this is even something that most pastors, myself included, do on a Sunday morning. It, but Jesus apparently isn't doing that, you know, it's not. Instead, at that moment in the synagogue, Jesus is, is, is acting as the authority. Church, in so many ways, what, what he's doing is confirming what it's written in the Gospel of John. He is becoming the Word made flesh. In other words, meaning that he is telling them that God is with them in the form of this preacher named Jesus of Nazareth himself, which is pretty amazing. Now, I just want to let you know that the Greek word for amaze that is in the Bible here can easily be a, a, a substitute for the word astonished. So astonished actually better conveys, I think, the thought of what maybe is going on in the, the minds of these people rather than being pleasantly surprised. Because at this point in time, no one really has come forward to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. You know, that won't happen until like the eighth chapter in Mark's gospel when Peter makes his famous confession. But not everyone was so astonished that day that they missed seeing Jesus as the Holy One of God because there was one man in that, in that synagogue that morning who did, the one with the evil spirit, the one who cries out, what have you come to do? What do you want from us? What have you, come, have you come to destroy us? Now, again, because of brevity, the writer of Mark doesn't really identify what evil spirits uh, possess this man, probably because, again, that's not that important to him. But what is important in this moment is this man in this synagogue has many spirits, evil spirits, that are troubling him. Imagine that, just for a second. Someone with deep and troubling issues is attending worship. So there goes the argument, I mean, right away, for those people who think that somehow or another we have it all together who gather here on a Sunday morning, amen? Here's the thought that might make you squirm, especially when we do return to in-person worship. You know, it's totally possible that someone with an in unclean spirit could be sitting right next to you, or, uh, well, at least six feet away and wearing a mask. I hope that doesn't discourage you from coming back to church. But here, there are two different ways, and I've said this in the past, ab ab about to approach the subject of evil and, and demonic possession. Uh, and, and both of these, I'm going to start off with saying, both of these ways are, are the extreme on either end. And, and they're both wrong. The first is to completely dismiss demonic possession or evil as harmless, it's not, or it doesn't exist. Now, the other mistake to make is to see demons as being more powerful than our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
because they are not. You might want to say amen to that. See, Jesus has the power, even today, even today, to command evil spirits to be quiet, and in particular, to leave this particular person. Still, still can be done today. In fact, <clears throat> truthfully, there's very little that we know about the spiritual realm. Um, plus, it can be said that the world that we live in is filled with everyday demons, so we kind of take for granted, like racism and sexism and, and, and poverty, just to name a few. Um, and anything, church, anything that destroys or intentionally destroys the quality of human life or human life is demonic. It's evil. And Jesus knew those demons existed not just in the world, church, but and not just in the dark places, but right under our own noses, in our own best places, and among some of the best, quote-unquote, people that we know. You know, there's an old saying that, can be, that was attributed to the poet Daniel Defoe that says, whenever God builds a church, the devil builds a chapel. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I grew up in the church, and I was, you know, probably disillusioned at some point in time early on, and then at the age of 16, I walked away. But, you know, I'm, from my church experience, I have connections, of course, as a, you know, from the kids I went to Sunday school. And a few years back, I actually got a, a, a call uh, from a former Sunday school classmate who heard that I was now a pastor. Now, <clears throat> After saying how incredulous that was to him, and I admitted to me too, he shared with me that his mother had recently passed away and he was wondering if I was available to do a funeral for the family. Well, unfortunately, Bobby and I were going away on a vacation just the next day and I told him I'd be away at that time. Well, he quickly thanked me and you know, he basically said, you know, Tom, I was brought up in the church, and a church where my parents, his parents, were leaders, very visible leaders. And I replied, yeah, no, I remember your mom and dad. And then he continued, but yet I can't step foot in a church today because, you know, as soon as we came home from church and my father changed his clothes, he would start in on and saying some of the most monstrously demonic, evil, racist things that I had ever heard. And in a moment, I, I thought to myself, I, I don't know how to respond, so I'm going to say nothing at this particular time because it's better, you know, as I've said many times, it's better to keep your mouth shut and look like a fool rather than open it up and prove it. You see, the truth of the matter is that the people Jesus cast demons out of are not monsters. They're not monstrous at all. They're troubled people with unclean spirits who need to be healed. The thing is, they need to ask for it or recognize the need to be healed. Now, here comes the ultimate understatement in the scripture we read. In the congregation that day, having witnessed what they just witnessed of this demonic possession being exercised, so to speak, they're all astonished. And once more, they all look around and say, what is this? <laughs> A new teaching? I gotta tell you, I have a feeling, <laughs> what I see in that moment is this. In other words, many of them didn't come to worship that day to experience such a healing, to see demons cast right out in front of them. Now, now all of that, will, all of this will get Jesus in trouble later on, and that's all written in Mark's Gospel too, because Jesus is breaking several long-standing rules. And the, the first is that the healing is occurring on the Sabbath, the, the day of rest. It's not supposed to happen. Uh, plus, the synagogue is a place for learning, not healing. You see, the rule was healings were to take place in the temple under the guidance of the priests. 
Now, honestly, for this to happen at that time, or even today in any congregation, including this one, when we finally get back to in-person worship, some in the sanctuary would remain frozen. Maybe some would jump out the windows and maybe others would rush the altar in a sudden mood of repentance. And a few just might just run out of the church and never come back again. But why not? Why not here? Why not during a teaching or a sermon? Here's the point. The battle versus the battle of good versus evil, right versus wrong, life versus death happens where people are gathered for worship and who want to be freed from them because we all potentially have demons that trouble us. All right. Some might not like that. Let me be more diplomatic. We all have issues. That's a truth. We all have issues. And you see, my hope, my fervent hope for every sermon that I deliver is that it would help eradicate any of the demonic or issues that are troubling people, right? You might sit there and saying to me or yourself, you're saying, hey, I'm not a racist and I'm not a sexist and I'm not somebody who has perpetrated poverty. I mean, I, I would offer though, that uh, what about the demons of depression? What about the demons of anxiety? What about those? You know, see, the truth is we live in the gap between what you have and what you fear. And if those issues are running your life, chances are they're ruining it at the same time, which makes them evil. Amen? Now, I recently read this that some people think having anxiety is what it means to feel alive. <laughs> Where did we get that one from? Church, Christ came to free us from all our demons, and he has the power to do so when we want it done. And if we devote ourselves to anything less in our faith, then we have missed a goal, a big goal of our faith. You see, Christ's teachings are meant to transform us as a way of freeing us from the issues that trouble us and keeping us from living the life that Jesus wants us to live. So please don't think that all the troubled people are outside the church because at one time or another, I was one of them. Sure, I woke up, I went to bed every night and woke up every morning uh, with my issues of depression and anxiety and fear and anger waiting for me. I even would come to church on occasion with those issues and pretty much leave this feeling the same way. But the day I saw my issues as demonic was the day when I asked Jesus to be healed from them. And Jesus did. But they still try to return. They haven't given up. We're just holding them at bay. That's why I come to church. So I can keep a check on them. They won't have any power that way. You know, in honor of uh, Groundhog's Day, I'm repeating a sermon, part of a sermon I gave uh, six years ago, where I think I told the congregation, if you've never seen the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, you're, you're missing a treat. Um, uh, in the movie, he plays a weatherman named Phil Connors, who's basically a fear-filled, angry, and self-absorbed person. Some, de some issues there, amen? What Phil fears being stuck in this small-time weatherman type of setting for the rest of his career, he has bigger aspirations for himself. But his anger comes out all the time with his smug, I'm better than you are attitude. And then he's assigned at this particular time to cover the, you know, the annual Groundhog Day Festival. And he doesn't conceal his displeasure in doing it. He feels it's beneath a man of his status and his talent. He then intimidates the cameraman, verbally abuses the producer Rita, thereby taking any fun for all of them out of the assignment. Only uh, and when the assignment's over, the crew packs up and attempts to leave town, 
only to be turned around actually because the blizzard that Phil forecast prior to his coming to the Puxatani area uh, actually happened and it closed down all the main roads so they had to return back to Puxatawney for the night. The next morning he awakens to Sonny and Cher singing <laughs> I got you babe. The roads though were still closed for the rest of the day and he has to then stay that whole extra day and which Phil then proceeds to destroy with his negative attitude and issues. Issues. He goes to bed that night and the next day begins the same way the day began the day before. 6 a.m., Sonny and Cher singing, I got you, babe. I want to say, talk about purgatory. Then Phil realizes something, that everyone but him is repeating the same day over and over, the exact same way they had, had uh, experienced the previous day. Now, initially, Phil was reluctant at all or unwilling to even see this was an opportunity to get today right. So instead, he begins to take adv advantage of various wrong ways of behaving. He seduces women, he steals money, he drives drunk, and church, he even stops flossing. But this self-destructive <laughs> pattern, it sets him on a downward spiral where he actually becomes suicidal all to no avail. I mean, the very next day, he wakes up to Sonny and Cher singing, I got you, babe. And then there's something that happens to him. As he repeats each day, he finds himself growing closer and closer to Rita as a love interest, as well as the people of Puxatani. The trouble is that Rita wants no part of him because of his past behavior. So what Phil does is he begins to memorize each and every portion of the day he's living over and over. And he tries to address the issues by remembering when he said something that was meant, but that was actually awful, or something that was terrible the day before. <laughs> I read an article a couple of years ago uh, regarding this movie. It's, it's considered a classic. And it said that in the, in the actual story it's, it's uh, written from, it would take Phil approximately 10,000 years to learn all of the things he had to learn during that time. Right. And you see his turning point though, Phil's turning point happens though when he tries to uh, rescue a homeless man from dying. No matter what he tries, no matter how positive he is, Phil realizes one thing, and one thing only in that moment, he can't stop death. And that's when he realizes how precious life is and becomes determined to change. Church, the man in that synagogue, that his turning point and mine actually, happened when we recognized Jesus Christ as the Holy One of God. So, if you struggle or struggle with any issues, whatever you want to call them, then let's just take a moment right now. Let's go before our Lord in prayer and ask God to be freed from whatever it is that's keeping us from living the life that Jesus wants for us. And the amazing good news of the day is, church, Jesus has still has all the authority as our Lord to rid us of each and every demon we ask him to. So let's pray. Gracious God, as we reach within our very being, there are issues, Lord God, that we wish to have resolved. Issues that are evil in so many ways, self-destructive in, way, in, in the way we deal with our lives, Help us, Lord God, help us, free us, Lord God. Come and take these issues, Lord. Come and take them, show them the light of day, show them the light of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to, help us to firmly stand before your throne of grace and mercy and shed these issues, Lord God, so that we can truly be a people that are free. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.
Amen. May it be so. Amen. Stay well. Oh, no.